you may wonder why an economist and former senior official of the IMF would want to talk about reality and human nature. It's because I think this subject is fundamental, it underlies and helps us to understand many issues. Let me explain. You know, the world is facing many difficult problems. We have financial crises, we have economic and uh, political uncertainties, we have growing inequality, we have the threat of global pandemics, we have environmental degradation, we have uh, uh, terrorism, we have armed conflict in some parts of the world. And I think there's a tide of human suffering because of uh, breakdown in family ties and uh, the fabric of society. And people see very little progress in addressing these issues, and they quite naturally get pessimistic and cynical. But I think if we examine all of these problems that I just mentioned, they are all problems that could be effectively addressed if people could work together to do so. They're all man-made problems. So the question then becomes, what is it in us that keeps us from cooperating? What is it in our heads? What are the obstacles that prevent people from effectively collaborating? People, countries, whatever. Well, in order to understand any problem, you have to try to understand the, the cause of it, the source of it. I think most people, if you ask them, what are these obstacles in our minds that inhibit cooperation, they would say, it's human nature to be selfish, to be competitive, and you can't change human nature. It's a very common thing that you hear. I think it is wrong on both counts. But, and I'm going to give you some examples that support that, uh, that point of view. But unfortunately, this idea of human nature underlies the vast majority of modern economics. It underlies modern political systems. It underlies public policy. It underlies the society in, in which we live, the legal system. It is fundamental to our environment, and we're very much affected by this uh, point of view. But I think it's a misperception of human nature, and therefore I want to talk for a minute about how we human beings perceive things. You've had a moment to look at this image on the screen. I think everybody first sees a goblet. It's very clear. If you haven't seen this image before, you may not have seen the two faces facing each other. Once you see them, you can then choose whether you want to see the goblet or the faces. There are two realities in this picture, and you can decide which one you want to see depending on your focus on that picture. Now, I don't think this is just a curiosity. I think this illustrates something very fundamental about the way hu we human beings perceive reality. From the time we are born, we are inundated with enormous amounts of information we have to try to make sense of. We learn to see patterns. We learn to recognize our mother's face. As we grow older, we learn ever more complicated concepts that help us to, to make sense and order of the world. You might call them mental frameworks or habits of thought. Uh, they can become very complex because it's a complex world and we have amazing minds. And this is essential. This is a wonderful feature of the way human beings uh, can operate. Uh, but of course, our teachers, our parents, they teach us what they think they know. And this process is by its nature simplifying and it can become limiting. And at some point, as we have gone through many years of this training and acquiring the mental frameworks of the past, we can become trapped by these ways of seeing reality. And we can just not see some other realities that are right in front of us because they're not what we are focusing on. But ultimately, we as individuals are each responsible for our own understanding of reality. We have to try to see other realities in the world around us. Like in this picture, there are two faces. Most people see only one. Some people have great difficulty in seeing the other face. But again, if somebody points it out to you, and some people need to have it pointed out, then you can choose which of those two images you want to see, which you want to focus on. So coming back to the question of human nature, uh, as I was saying, the usual view of human nature is that people are competitive, they are selfish, they are often even mean and aggressive. Uh, but I think there's another reality, which is probably much more important. 
You know, it is impossible for man to live alone. There are very few documented cases in all of history of anybody living any length of time alone. We depend on other human beings for our very life. We are members of communities. We are in a social environment, in a social fabric. We care about each other. We are concerned about each other. We are compassionate. We are generous. Well, you may be saying at this point, some people, what planet is he from? <laughs> you know, my personal experience is quite different. People are aggressive. They're mean. They're, you know, I have to defend myself. And look at the news. It's full of all kinds of bad things happening in the world and how terrible the world is. Well, the news is a very good example of what I'm trying to say about focus. We all know that the news focuses on the bad. We all know that there are probably thousands and, I don't know, tens of thousands of good things happening all the time for any bad thing that happens. But we choose to focus on the bad things, and the news does that because people do that. So it's part of a system of focusing on one aspect of reality. Now, I promised to give you some examples. Um, man can change. Man is educable. Uh, we, we can improve. And we see that because we have education. This is what we do with our children. It's accepted all over the world. We want them to learn. We want them to grow. And the stories that are told in cultures are usually about people who have overcome obstacles, who have risen above, have had some kind of vision, and have contributed to their society despite the difficulties they face. And what about whether people are concerned about each other, whether people can be generous and so forth? You know, more than 90 million people have watched a YouTube video about human rights abuses and atrocities in Uganda. 90 million people. How many of those people will ever go to Uganda or know Ugandans? Why are they watching this video? Nobody's forcing them, but they're interested. They're concerned. They want to know the story. They are sympathized with the suffering. Another. Very powerful example. 21 million articles on Wikipedia written by volunteers sharing their hard-earned knowledge and understanding with the world without any reward for themselves, often in a collaborative way. You don't know usually who wrote the articles. And these are not insignificant examples. These are Examples that are changing the way many people in the world understand what's happening in the world and access information. These are powerful forces in the world. And they reflect a very different view of human nature. I'm sure if you think in these terms, if you try to focus on other elements of the reality, you'll see uh, that there are many examples around us in the world that illustrate these points. I want to give an example from my field, which is economics, and my interest in globalization. Globalization has a bad name among many people. It's blamed for many things. They think of it as being exploitation and uh, all kinds of things. One of the explanations for globalization is technology. We all know that the world is growing smaller because people can more easily travel, they can trade, they can communicate, we're more aware of each other, and they say, all right, this is because we have all these wonderful technologies that enable that. But this is a description, it is not an explanation. And the reason for that is that there are thousands of inventions for every one that gets marketed, produced and marketed. And there are thousands of products marketed for every one that is widely accepted and has a big impact. So it is not the supply of innovation that drives this process, it is the demand. It is, this is something that people want. Now, what do they want? They like to communicate. They like to be connected with each other. They like to understand. They like to know. And they like variety. Why do people want to take exotic vacations in faraway places rather than just going to a nice place at home? There are so many examples of this desire for being connected. I think that it reflects a growing awareness of the oneness of human humanity, that we're all members of one family, and we show concern and interest in our fellow human beings increasingly, even though they may be in very distant places or very different than us. <coughs> so we see, I think, very powerful forces in the world that are bringing the world together. And like any such powerful forces, there are counter forces. 
just like in physics. And there are many people who feel distressed, they feel disturbed, it's moving too quickly, there's too much diversity, there are many problems, they would much rather go back to a time that was more familiar, when they were more isolated and weren't uh, bombarded with so many differences. And this is quite understandable. I think this is very much the fundamental question in Europe with its current crisis. Europeans have to decide what does it mean to be European. Do we embrace diversity? Do we enjoy the differences? Or do we want to try to go back to a more familiar uh, cultural and economic time when we were more isolated? It's important to understand these questions and then to make decisions. So you might ask at this point, if people are so concerned with, the, with each other and have this good side, why isn't the world already a wonderful place? And I think this is a very important question and a very fair question. I think one of the reasons is that our expectations can become self-fulfilling. You know, if a country expects another country to be aggressive, it will prepare itself to defend itself and it'll uh, increase armaments and so forth. And the other country will see that and they will also increase armaments. And this is how World War I started. Somebody fires a shot and suddenly there's a big conflict and nobody can explain a good reason. Uh, this actually happens all the time. We didn't learn our lesson back in World War I. This is a very common feature of societies and it works between people. If we expect somebody to be aggressive to us, we will tend to be, take an aggressive stance and that can be self-fulfilling. Our expectation can become the reality and then we'll say, you see, I was right. But it is a vicious circle. It is a system that we have to try to uh, break out of. So how can we overcome these mental obstacles uh, to more cooperation? I'm a realist. I spent a long career working with governments from the most senior levels on down. I have some idea of the environment in which people work in today's world and the way the world works. And I don't expect somehow overnight people to become marvelously cooperative and solve all the problems. It's just not, the, not a reasonable expectation. What we do see in the history of the last 150 years is that the inherent instability and conflicts in our way of doing things generate huge crises. And if it's a big enough crisis, then people say, this is awful, we have to do something, and they respond, and they learn some lessons, they maybe create some institutions, and then they go forward. Unfortunately, there's often then another crisis, and so we go from one crisis to another. Well, why is this? I think one of the reasons is that we have the wrong incentives for our leaders. Let me give you an example. If you have a small western town in America, that's where I come from, <laughs> where there's a good sheriff, and he has lots of deputies, he's very effective, he works hard, he keeps law and order, the bad guys stay away, they go other places. Nothing bad happens in this town. After a while, people begin to wonder, why are we spending so much money on our sheriff's department? Because nothing bad happens here. They start to grumble, they cut his budget, he retires, Nobody remembers him because there was nothing newsworthy happening in that place. Now, in another town where they have no sheriff, the bad guys come in, there's a terrible crisis. They call in the Lone Ranger. He rides in on his white horse. He gets rid of the bad guys. He rides off into the sunset. He's the great hero, and people tell stories about him for generations. Now, you probably know this is part of American mythology. Uh, this is also the way much of corporate world works when there are problems. They try to bring in somebody from outside. <clears throat> but this illustrates the wrong incentives. And it's become common wisdom today among leaders that they are unable to take action to solve problems, especially if it's expensive or difficult, unless there's a crisis. They say so quite openly. So we lurch from one crisis to the next. So what is our role as individuals in this process? I think we have to try to understand what's happening. We have to try to see the reality in the situation, to understand the forces at work, and then to try then to contribute to the process of learning that is essential. Every time there's a crisis and a problem, there's something that we have to learn. Just like individuals, in your, you're raising children, you try to give them advice, but it's when they're having a problem, when they're having a crisis, 
hopefully they'll listen to some advice, they'll better understand the nature of the problem, and they'll grow in the way that is necessary to avoid having the same problem over and over again. It's the same problem with societies and with the world. So to summarize my line of thinking, I think that the world is growing smaller because that's what people want. I think, therefore, that's a process that will continue. I think that it requires much greater cooperation in the world to address the problems that arise. And I think, clearly, it's not against human nature to cooperate. We can do it. But we have to understand these issues. We have to see things the way they really are, and we have to not be trapped by outmoded fra uh, mental frameworks and ways of thinking. And then in our personal lives, we can try as individuals to see the good in others around us, which will be good for both them and for us. And we can try and ask our politicians to try cooperating for a change. And in that way, we may contribute to a better world. Thank you.